you heard of William Cooper from northern Queensland? He's one of the best-known artists in the world, painting birds, and you've probably seen his work. Often when I'm, if I'm doing a lot of painting for a book, there'll be a few that I'm certainly not familiar with, and uh, in some cases I have to travel overseas to find some of these birds, but I like to always see the bird alive, and I do sketches in the field using binoculars, and uh, or if I can get closer I might need to use binoculars, but... Uh, And then I'll try and find it in a zoo or a sanctuary or somewhere where I can get nice and close and do lots and lots of drawings of the bird. And usually say I've never seen a bird before and I look at it, I sketch it, and the more I sketch it, the more I'll find that the first ones weren't real good. They They develop as they go along and it's the more you draw it, the more you start to capture what makes the bird look like the bird. William Cooper talking to Amanda Smith on RN a while ago. And now there's a magnificent book featuring his life and art. It's written by Penny Olson, who lives in Canberra. And this is how she brought it off, without doubt a major coup. An Eye for Nature, The Life and Art of William T. Cooper is a book that nearly didn't happen. I first met Bill, as he likes to be known off canvas, and his wife Wendy on a sparkling June day in 2000 at the Botanic Gardens here in Canberra. As Queenslanders, the Coopers well remember the chill of the snow-capped mountains to the capital south. I'd corresponded with Bill, but never met him. He was one of the artists featured in my book Feather and Brush, Three Centuries of Australian Bird Art, which was soon to be released. Two or three years later, we met again in the same place. At the urging of natural history bookseller Andrew Isles, Bill asked me whether I would be interested in writing his biography. I was reluctant and I was flattered, but at that stage, although I'd written a lot of descriptive books, I was unsure whether I could manage narrative. I also felt that I did not know him well enough. So I politely knocked him back. Well, how silly was that? Thankfully, a decade later, he asked again. I didn't fully know it at the time, but his remarkable story is a great gift for an author, especially one like me who loves illustrated books. But how was I going to approach the biography? It could be a book about Bill's life's work, a celebration of his art. He has been so prodigious that there would have been more than enough ground to cover. But then Bill has published illustrated books aplenty, and they speak for themselves. So I decided it should be a biography of the man, not just a celebration of his art. Then I worried, I'm a great worrier, over the writing of a biography of a very much living person. Would I upset Bill or Wendy? It felt like a very big responsibility. I sought advice online. Wikipedia, the online source we all often start with but like to deny, wisely advises that biographies of living people are not the place for content that is sensationalistic or malicious in intent. Given that Bill is an uncontroversial figure, I felt those recommendations would not be too limiting. I could save the sex and scandal for my next book. Bill's path in life could easily be construed as a rags to riches story. Perhaps that was the hook I was looking for. His upbringing was tough, especially by today's standards. He was born at the tail end of the Depression. His family lived on the outskirts of Newcastle in a squat built from scrap material. And in Bill's teen years, his father became a violent alcoholic. Yet, while his family's house was unbeautiful and the living meagre, for a nature-mad boy, the bush around was exactly the opposite. More importantly, Bill was loved and supported in his interests. His father taught him to value the wonders of the bush and his mother encouraged his interest in bird books and drawing. I wondered how a boy who grew up on the fringes of an industrial city where the greatest aspiration was to get a trade could become such an accomplished artist. It didn't take much delving to discover that Newcastle has a long and distinguished artistic tradition going back to convict artists Joseph Lysett and Richard Brown. Great portraitist Sir William Dovell, who advised Bill at one stage, was Newcastle-born and took refuge there again in the 1940s. There were local art competitions and a fine art gallery, and perhaps more significantly, a library with a rare set of Goulds, the Birds of Australia, which young Bill pored over while his mother went shopping. It was not the words that held his attention, but the dramatic illustrations. Still, Bill's route to wildlife art was far from smooth. 
school captain in primary school, he dropped out of high school, defiantly throwing his exercise books, their pages bordered with sketches of birds off the top of a cliff. Teenage taxidermist, delivery boy, amateur boxer, ballroom dancer, window dresser, contrary conscript, hand illustrated tyre salesman and landscape painter were just some of his incarnations. Creativity and nature were a constant. Finding his niche as a natural history painter provided Bill with an entree into a life of adventure, exploration, discovery and unique experiences of the natural world. All along his journey he has met exceptional individuals, experts and dignitaries and people living extraordinary lives. He's travelled through India, East Africa, Japan, Indonesia, Malaysia and of course across Australia in search of birds. That, I decided, must be the biography's unifying theme, how his life and art are inextricable. My next challenge was to find an appropriate voice. I had several to hand. I knew that there was correspondence, including early letters from prominent Sydney ornithologists Keith Hindwood and Alec Chisholm, and from Bill's aunt and uncle, Vic and Glad Bird. The birds had saved a few of Bill's letters and, convinced of his talent, encouraged him to keep his early artistic efforts, which I've included in the book. Over the years, Bill has received a great many congratulatory letters from all manner of people, including a few from women hopeful of sharing more than his art. He rang me one day to say that he was tidying his papers and asked whether I wanted to see all these missives. I replied, of course, I want to see everything. I got to see the survivors of the cull, but that was enough. I started to interview Bill's friends and colleagues, but quickly realised that most did the same thing. Great bloke, great artist. I was grateful to be able to leave the acclamations to David Attenborough, drawing on his words to sing Bill's praises. Attenborough is among the many long-term admirers of Bill's artwork. He calls him the greatest living wildlife illustrator. Many years ago, Bill and David wandered over their mutual fascination for the same illustration in the same book, The Glorious Painting of a Lesser Bird of Paradise from Gould's Birds of Australia, reproduced in the Batesford Colour Book series. It took me a while to appreciate that I had yet another voice in front of me, the diaries Bill keeps wherever he travels, going right back to two small pads from his first trip overseas to New Guinea in 1973. The notes are very spare, but they are his voice, fresh, unselfconscious and unfiltered by memory. As much as possible, I used Bill's own words, and they helped me to set the tone. In that and other ways, the biography is a collaboration between Bill and I, and Wendy too. Wendy, Bill's partner in life and work, was forever pulling out half-forgotten gems stowed away from his earlier life. She is a remarkable person in her own right. With Bill's encouragement and no formal training, she has become a respected botanist, renowned around the world. Together they have published three books on fruiting plants in Australia's tropical rainforests, covering nearly two and a half thousand species. The other boon was Bill's library. Books have always been important to him, and these provided a chronology of several significant moments in his life. From childhood he collected nature books, each inscribed with his name, the date and an address. The Cooper's current address is Topaz on the Atherton Tableland in far north Queensland. The house is surrounded on all sides by tropical rainforest with an abundance of wildlife, brush turkeys and bowerbirds, honey eaters, parrots, finches, pigeons and rat kangaroos. Bill feeds them seed and leftover fruit. The rifle birds and robins get mealworms, proffered in his hand. He talks to them. He is gentle, patient and respectful. He knows this world well. Because Bill has watched wild animals all his life, he has an exceptional feel for them. He describes what he calls mind maps. When he hears a bird call high in the canopy, his well-developed visual imagination transports him up to see the scene in closer detail. The knots on the branch, a beetle creeping among the lichen, the bird's glistening eye, its feathers ruffling in the breeze. Bill feels a need to see his subjects in the flesh, in the wild by preference. He's not just a gifted artist who sits in a light-filled studio painting beautiful birds. He and Wendy work hard. They meticulously research their subjects and precisely plan their trips to see them in action in their environment. They are industrious and disciplined in their home life too. Theirs may be a peaceful tropical retreat, but it is no retreat from their work. 
For two to three years in the early 70s, while Bill was working on Parrots of the World, he painted 14 hours a day, seven days a week. He says it was never a chore, and when he needed to, every now and then, he would take a week off and head bush. Now, at 80, Bill still works six or so hours a day. He leaves the studio less often because he feels the need to paint while he can. But he and Wendy still make regular excursions, most often northwards or inland. Wherever he is, Bill is always on that lookout for fresh compositions or picture stories, taking in the play of light, the harmony of colours, seeking out the perfectly curved branch, the appropriate food tree or beetle, ever alert for unusual or little-known behaviours. He leans towards the more colourful birds with big personalities, which make dramatic natural portraits, parrots, birds of paradise, hornbills, kingfishers and fairy wrens. These subjects set him apart from the grand traditions of North American and European animal portraiture, which had their roots in hunting and other sports. Yet, in effect, Bill has blended those artistic traditions with a great attention to detail and accuracy required of strictly scientific illustrators. As a result, he has revitalised the 19th century artistry of the magnificent big bird books of John James Audubon and Gould. During the decade that I've known him, Bill has often complained that he would like to paint larger, looser work, but that he finds himself before the easel, following the same formula, arranging a pair of birds in a delicately rendered landscape and solving technical problems as he has always done. In response, I can only echo the words of the wife of another wildlife artist who wrote of Bill's frustrations. Only the painter knows how his work falls short of his hopes. The rest of us are dazzled and delighted. Delighted beyond measure. The pictures are both marvellous and scientifically accurate. Penny Olson's book, An Eye for Nature, The Life and Art of William T. Cooper, has just been published. Next week, Ockham's turns his razor to manufacturing in Australia. Should it really be cut out and left to others elsewhere? Or is there still plenty we could do and do well? I'm Robin Williams.